This is Bloomberg Crypto, a daily Bloomberg iHeart podcast. And I'm Stacey Marie Ishmael, Managing Editor of Crypto for Bloomberg News. It's Friday, November 18th. What a week this has been. I could say that pretty much every week, but seriously, what a week it has been. Every single day this week, something has happened in crypto that has led everyone from investors to regulators to crypto CEOs to ask themselves the question, hang on a minute, what just happened? Things are moving fast and things are getting pretty serious. And here to help me break down the news is Bloomberg Crypto senior editor Philip Lagerkranzer, based in Switzerland. Almost half of all crypto trading volumes globally went via Binance. The runner-up is Coinbase, and they're at 5%. So that gives you kind of a sense of just how big Binance is. And Bloomberg crypto senior editor Sunil Jaktiani, based in Sydney, but with me here in Singapore. I think it's the kind of thing you can only expect to see in crypto. I cannot imagine something like that happening anywhere else. Neil, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Stacey Berry. Tell the folks what you do. We've not had you on before. I am the senior crypto editor uh, for Asia for Bloomberg. I'm normally based in Sydney, but today I'm in the tropical island paradise of Singapore. Excellent. And Phil, welcome back to the show. You're an old hand at this by now. Yeah, I guess you can call it that. (laughs) Thank you. I mean that only in the (laughs) sense of experience. So let's flash back in time to... The weekend, although I'm not sure that we technically have weekends anymore. We just have days that turn into other days. But Sunil, what what, what was going on for you this weekend? Well, we knew that there might be some activity on Saturday. So we were logged in and ready and waiting. And lo and behold, and it took a while for us to fully accept this was happening. Lo and behold, we saw that (laughs) there was an enormous hack perpetrated on the recently collapsed FTX exchange. And through the course of Saturday, we reported out that story and we saw the size of the hack gradually escalate from an initial estimate of around $250 million to eventually more than $650 million. So you had the ignominy of a hack on FTX happening right as the company is falling into bankruptcy. And really, I think it's the kind of thing you can only expect to see in crypto. I cannot imagine something like that happening anywhere else. So that, that was our Saturday. Sounds totally chill. Sounds like a normal Saturday in crypto. <laughs> and we get into Saturday, we get into the weekend. We're still trying to figure out who is behind this hack. You know, theories and speculations are flying around. And over the course of the next couple of days, something interesting happens as it relates to how CZ, uh, who is the CEO of Binance, and Binance itself are sort of positioning their role in this evolving crisis. Phil, what exactly has been going on there? With SPF, crypto kind of lost, I guess, what we could call the chief diplomat or the person. I suppose what he would like to call himself chief diplomat. I'm not sure we would call him that necessarily. Yeah, no, there's a very there's a very good point. And and all those things are obviously moot now, but there is a vacuum that somebody needs to step into. And CZ is busily casting himself as just a person to step into this. So if you've seen even other big ex- executives in this industry have been forced on the defensive, Crypto.com CEO has been out talking about how your funds are safe and you don't need to worry. Um, you know, we have adequate reserves, et cetera, et cetera. CZ sort of went on the offensive instead and started, you know, making a lot of tweets, a lot of speeches, a lot of comments in the vein of let's all come together, let's rebuild. You know, we need more regulation. We need better governance. So he started casting himself as as this person who is now the prime representative, I guess, of the crypto industry. And it, obviously, in a way, it makes sense. huh? I mean, if you look at the data that we used in our story from Crypto Compare in the last week, they handled almost 50 percent. Almost half of all crypto trading volumes globally went via Binance. The runner up is Coinbase and they're at 5 percent. So you, that gives you kind of a sense of just how big Binance is in today's crypto. Mm-hmm. 
Now, one of the interesting tensions, which we've addressed a few times on this podcast and which we will continue to address, is between the idea of the crypto industry presenting itself as like a bastion of decentralization, right? And that there's no one person in charge. There's no cabal of insiders determining the financial system to the detriment of the ordinary person. And yet, <laughs> what tends to happen in a crisis, particularly a financial crisis, is you do see various kinds of coordination because people are trying to figure out, okay, what do we need to do to stop this from getting worse? And that was very much true in the 2008 financial crisis that, of course, was the root of the creation of Bitcoin itself. And it's been true with governments around the world trying to deal with rising inflation worldwide. And now it's happening in crypto, perhaps unexpectedly, where, you know, various crypto CEOs are trying to tell other crypto CEOs, hey, you should be transparent because your transparency is good for all of us. Or CZ encouraging other folks in the industry to support this fund, which is explicitly to backstop, you know, people who might have, as the euphemism goes, liquidity challenges. In the course of reporting, and frankly for us because we're editors, in the course of editing the stories that our reporters are doing, how are we finding that people in the industry are trying to reconcile this tension? Are they trying to reconcile this tension? I think right now, the the dominant narrative is, I mean, if you look at the big players like CZ, for instance, the dominant narrative is sort of one of salvage mode. So it, it seems to be like kind of the principles that the industry built itself upon as decentralization seems to be giving way, in at least in the telling of, of some of these executives, to the fact that right now we kind of need to come together. We need to re-establish trust with everybody from regulators to politicians to obviously our actual customers. Huh? If you look at this fund that uh, CZ has been tweeting and talking about, it very much has the appearance of a little bit of an off-the-cuff invention, a, you know, something that, that very much looked good in a tweet, and it, it's a very nice talking point. The, the thing is, we don't have any details on, like, how big it's going to be and what exactly it's going to be doing. It's going to back... So we know that CSET has said, for instance, okay, we, we small. some projects are small, they're very promising, they're not troubled, they just need a little bit of money. Well, that's one thing, huh? If you want to look into a slightly a smaller decentralized product or protocol that's promising. But the big thing here is right now, the big mm -hmm. players are the ones that are getting attacked. I mean, you're seeing outflows from major exchanges. And so it's unclear really how how that is going to solve that particular problem. So I guess it's a little bit of both. But right now I'm seeing mostly a sort of centralization narrative almost. And Sunil, one thing when we talk about crises, which we seem to do a lot in crypto. <laughs> but one thing when we talk about crises that we often get into is regulators. And at the same time that there's this narrative among crypto CEOs of like, you know, what are the kinds of things that we can do? We disavow bad actors. Those people don't represent us. There's also an immediate and slightly confusing parallel narrative of this is all the regulator's fault. <laughs> you know, this is an industry that spent years saying, don't regulate us with your stupid Wall Street rules that don't apply to us, then pivoted to, if you're going to regulate us, here are some rules that we've written, feel free to refer to them and adopt them wholesale, to, okay, fine, if you're going to regulate us, use those rules, but we would really prefer to have these particular regulators be in charge, to now seeming to blame regulators that they had been fobbing off for a very long time for missing this latest story. Is it possible to be a regulator and win in this kind of environment? I don't think it's possible to be a winning regulator in any situation, really, if we're being honest. Regulators take years to frame their policies and crypto evolves at the speed of light. So <laughs> it's no surprise that they've been behind in their effort to try and figure out how to regulate and how to manage the growth of the industry. I think what you will find now is that 
there's a very clear perception and awareness of what comes from concentration risk. So it mm -hmm. links to what you were discussing just now with Phil. And while people are hoping that CZ comes out with a fund that can help to steady the sector, with Sam Bankman Freed and the collapse of FTX, we've seen what happens if you have too much power concentrated in one particular personal enterprise when that enterprise isn't appropriately regulated. So I think it's a, I would say a delicious tension in the industry right now. And I don't think anybody really has an appropriate answer. And that in a nutshell is the problem of regulating crypto. <laughs> it's been years and nobody has come up with the answer and we get repeated crises. And I would suspect that's going to carry on happening for a while longer yet. Infuriating. And there's a point in relation to that as well, sorry to break in here, but the the regulation has been focused, if you look at what the focus has been, it's KYC, know your customer, i.e. don't take sanctioned money, for instance, and it's AML, anti-money laundering and anti-terrorist financing. Sure, that was that was fine up until this year, but then the industry itself started breaking down. And the regulation doesn't seem to be uh, have been equipped to deal with the fact that you now have like major failures across the industry among large players and not only major isolated failures, but cascading failures. And it's like A, the regulation is clearly not in place to deal with that. And B, it is entirely clear how such regulation might even look. We'll be right back with more of the week's top crypto stories featuring Philip Lagerkranze and Sunil Jagtiani. This week in Singapore, Bloomberg hosted a major conference for financial services professionals and other folks. And I interviewed Anthony Scaramucci. Yes, that Anthony Scaramucci of, you know, multiple Scaramucci's fame. And he was very candid in talking about his experience with Sam Bankman-Fried and FTX and noting that earlier this year, just weeks ago, weeks before that bankruptcy filing, he'd sold 30% of his company to SBF and, and to FTX and saying that, you know, he personally introduced Sam to folks in the Middle East and that, you know, he was sort of using his personal capital on his behalf and just feeling like blindsided almost by by how this can happen. But he also said something interesting, I thought, about those personal relationships again and, and the idea of trust. And his allegation was that, you know, Sam and CZ of Binance have had, shall we say, interpersonal animus <laughs> for some time. They didn't necessarily get along. And that some of what happened in the last couple of weeks partly reflected the tension between outsized personalities. And that's something that our colleague Mike Regan has written about. You know, we've we've sort of been documenting the the egos of mostly men in crypto. And and Phil, because you, you know, you wrote that story about CZ kind of stepping in into this role, and also because you're newer to crypto, have you observed that kind of sharp elbowed behavior, either in the folks that you're talking to or in just like the kinds of stories that you're editing? I mean, before coming to crypto, I'd never seen behavior anything remotely like this. There's no industry where I've that I've covered over 23 years in journalism where you can have a Twitter fight break out between two of the titans of the industry and that then leading sort of indirectly. I mean, obviously, we should be careful to, to state that, you know, sooner or later, the FTX empire would have probably come undone anyway, given what about we now know. About the balance know. sheet. But I don't, ab about the balance sheet and about the way that they were, you know, the relationships with Alameda and how they were basically running things, or I guess you should say not running things. But you, you, you had a situation here. What, what we do know is that CZ made that tweet on a Sunday saying we're dumping $530 million worth of the FTT token. And panic breaks out. Pandemonium breaks out. Five billion dollars yanked from FTX in one day, according to Bankman Freed. So, you know, I've never seen anything like this before. And, and, and frankly, it's hard to see in any way, shape or form how this would be good for an industry that frankly is limping right now. 
The blow-ups this year are too many to even recount here. We'd be sitting here for hours. This is where Scaramucci's narrative is quite interesting to me because it's so at odds with the narrative that CZ and, and Binance is, is, are putting out there, which is basically, and I, 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 to be honest with you, like I'm not taking sides here at all. What I am noting is that there are two very different narratives out there. You have the narrative that Scaramucci was, was out pointing out to you, Stacey, which is basically, okay, this was an act of retaliation, probably. And then you have the narrative from Binance saying, mm -hmm. no, actually, we knew that something was wrong because we read the Coindesk article as some everybody else. And we knew that we have a very large bag of FTT and we have a, a basically a duty towards our own customers and users to, to you know, to deal with this situation. And, and you know, mm -hmm. who knows? What we do know now is that this went down in an extraordinarily messy mm -hmm. fashion. Sunil, as somebody who is also a veteran of various types of, of financial markets and has, you've had a really interesting set of places that you've lived and like different types of places that you've covered. If you were to analogize at all the behavior that you're seeing in crypto, is there anywhere else you've ever seen anything like this? Any other journalistic context? I'm going to say nuclear weapons because from, <laughs> from nuclear weapons, we know that uh, people understand the do doctrine of mutually assured destruction. And we know that you know, nuking each other is a bad idea. But if you look at what happened with the CZ tweet and the chain of events that followed that, you get the sense that there's a whiff of, in crypto, people can do things that can take each other down and cause a huge crisis that gets people asking about whether the industry has any future at all. And that, I think, is different to most other industries, if not all the sectors I've covered. It's rare that you find yourself in a situation where you're wondering, do these people really understand that they could totally destroy the industry that they work in? So that's pretty unique. And, and it goes back to your question about trust. You were saying you have this conception of a trustless ecosystem, right? But the truth is there are various layers of trust all the way down. You, you trust that the underlying blockchain is going to work the way it's supposed to work. You trust that the individual whisk kid really has a sound vision and will run his company properly. There are various levels of trust. And at a very high level, one thing you want to trust in is the idea that people in the industry aren't going to blow each other up. And it looks like we can't have any trust in that either, which I would say is not a good thing. On that genuinely apocalyptic note, I think we shall end there. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. You can find more of Phil and Sunil's reporting and editing on the Bloomberg Terminal and on Bloomberg.com, or check us out on the Bloomberg Crypto Newsletter. And finally, if you have any comments or feedback, you can always find us at crypto at Bloomberg.net. This is Bloomberg Crypto, a daily podcast from Bloomberg and iHeartRadio. For more shows from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Send us your comments, questions, or suggestions for the show to crypto at Bloomberg.net. The supervising producer of Bloomberg Crypto is Vicky Vergolina. Our senior producer is Janet Babin. Our producers are Mohamed Farouk and Sharon Bariro. Our associate producers are Ty Butler and Moses Undam. Desta Wonderad is our engineer. Original music by Leo Sidron. I'm Stacey Marie Ishmael. We'll be back tomorrow. <laughs>